All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this course, BC212 on Christian apologetics. Thank you all for connecting, joining, and it's really good to have you all back uh, after the long summer break. Uh, I know some people, we have been in touch, but others, uh, it's good to reconnect after, after the break. So welcome back. I have uh, turned the recording on. So this uh, entire lecture and also the next lecture will be uh, recorded uh, for the benefit of uh, those who would like to go and you know listen to it. And this recording will also be used on our e-learning portal. Uh, recordings will be available both in the Google Classroom, uh, in the classwork section, as well as the e-learning portal for students who are studying on the e-learning portal. So uh, welcome. Let's pray and pray together. Then we will uh, uh, get started today and uh, look forward to journeying with all of you this semester and uh, growing together, interacting, uh, learning with you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just request uh, somebody to lead us in uh, prayer. Who wants to pray? Who would like to pray? Just can open up. Okay, I pray, Pastor. Oh, Dinesh, go ahead, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this, this, this class. Uh, I know your purpose is, uh, your will is to attend these classes. Uh, I know for each one of the, them, uh, each one of student, you are making a will and opening doors uh, through by many lecturers like Pastor Ashish. Uh, I know your, um, I pray your uh, will may be completed in our life as per the what, uh, whatever ministry of a decided pastor. Father, uh, thank you, plus uh, the whole class. Uh, Father, uh, may uh, your uh, interpretation uh, may or not occur. I, may all the students be blessed uh, in this teaching. Uh, bless Pastor uh, Ashish's um, uh, health, uh, also students' health. Uh, may all your will happen uh, as per your will happen, uh, Father. I plead you. Once again, for protection for students, family, lecturer, uh, this time, Father. I submit all the students, all the students and uh, all the lecturers in your might hand. Bless them, uh, give them wisdom, also give, uh, help us to grab the wisdom, uh, knowledge. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, it's good to have you all back here in class and uh, look forward to a great time. All right. So we're going to get started with the introduction and then uh, you know, get into the course that we have before us on Christian apologetics. Um, uh, the PDF uh, of uh, the course overview, the course overview PDF, as well as the, the PDF for this first lecture has been put up, put up in the coursework se uh, section in Google Classroom. So please download it and you can use it. Uh, I will uh, also share it uh, from my computer as we go along. Uh, and uh, uh, week by week, we will release um, the PDFs to you for the lectures on a weekly basis. So, or, or each time we get into a new chapter. 
So chapter by chapter, we'll release the PDFs to you so you could download it and use it uh, as we uh, journey to this course together. All right, so let's uh, just do a quick uh, introduction, a quick overview uh, to this course, what we are looking at, what we intend to cover, and um, then we'll go forward from there. So our course on Christian apologetics, um, really, uh, what are we uh, looking at? What are we uh, journeying into? Uh, we want to be in a place where we could uh, provide answers or respond to questions uh, that people have about our Christian faith, about what we believe, about what the Bible teaches. And we want to do it in a manner that will, you know, impact their hearts, impact their hearts and minds. Right? So we want to do it, of course, in love. The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. So we want to do it lovingly. And yet we want to do it intelligently. That means we need to have uh, a, a reasonable answers. Uh, now, Christian apologetics, uh, as it is today in the Christian world, is, is a very, very vast field. And, you know, you, you will find that there are people who take several different approaches to uh, this whole field of Christian apologetics. Uh, there are those who take a very philosophical approach, meaning uh, uh, their answers, their responses will be hugely philosophical, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, the questions of why and what and so on. Uh, using logic uh, and philosophy. Then there are those who are more scientific or evidence-based, you know, and so here you have people who study archaeology or study different scientific uh, fields, streams, uh, and uh, their response or their um, uh, approach to apologetics is evidence-based. You know, okay, we found this, we saw this, and it's based on that. That's another stream of apologetics. A third stream would be purely theological, you know, they will provide answers from scripture. You know, the Bible says this, and this is, you know, and, 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 a, and a purely theological or a scriptural response to questions. Uh, and a fourth stream would be what we would call as a spiritual or supernatural, where uh, we come from a purely spiritual point of view, basing our responses on uh, spiritual or supernatural experiences. Uh, what we want to do in this course is something uh, quite different from what, you know, generally uh, the way the way apologetics is approached. Uh, we want to try and blend all of four of these. So, um, you know, there will be some parts of what we talk about, which are philosophical in nature, some which are scientific, evidence-based, some which are you know, theological, biblical, scriptural, and some, of course, will come from a supernatural uh, perspective. So we want to try and blend these. Um, so uh, that's our approach in this course. That's going to be our approach in this course on uh, giving answers to questions. Now, some of the things that we are going to address now, like we said, you know, uh, apologetics itself is a huge, huge uh, area. Um, so, uh, you know, we've intentionally picked out certain things that that would be uh, of use use for us. Um, and so, uh, what what we're going to do is so we, today we will start off with um, uh, just trying to understand apologetics. Uh, and one of the things that we want to impress is that. True biblical apologetics is a combination or is a blending of reasoning and demonstration. Uh, in many evangelical circles, apologetics is purely, you know, uh, words or reason, and it's confined to that. But uh, we want to see from Scripture that the defense of the gospel is not only reason, it's also demonstration. It's both wisdom and power. So Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. So um, uh, biblical apologetics is really a combination or it's a blending of uh, wisdom and power, reason and demonstration. And that's the way uh, we should be doing it. Uh, we don't have the option of 
okay, I will only do reason or I'll only demonstrate. You need to blend both, and that's what we will emphasize. Then we'll talk about questions like on the existence of God, creation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about science and faith. Uh, we'll explore some things about Darwin's theory. Uh, we'll look at uh, the Big Bang theory of cosmology. Uh, we will then shift to, you know, the Bible, its authenticity and accuracy. Why do we believe the Bible is true? Uh, we'll also talk about the uniqueness of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, then we'll talk about, you know, how uh, the fact that salvation is in Jesus. Why do we say salvation is only through Jesus Christ? Um, then we talk about how do we communicate our faith with um, uh, Hindu, Hindus, Muslims, and we'll take a look at other worldviews. Uh, you know, how do we interact with people of other worldviews? Uh, we will also address a few contemporary cults. How do we respond to them? And then we will talk about uh, responding to certain social challenges uh, that we all are confronted with in our modern world. And uh, then lastly, we'll talk about a biblical understanding of suffering and then get into some time for answering common questions along these lines. So really we try to cover a lot of ground um, um, we're going to try to balance width and depth, uh, but uh, obviously we're not going to be able to delve in one subject too long because we also want to cover other topics, as you can see. Uh, but what I hope is um, that you would get an understanding of how to think, how to respond, uh, and then if there are areas that you are interested in, you can delve further uh, into those areas. Um, we'll have three simple assessments as we go along based on the content we cover and you know our grading scheme. Uh, exams are easy here, so don't worry. Um, the uh, some ref you know uh, we will be giving you course material uh, as we go along chapter by chapter. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of uh, online resources that you could go to to look at, to listen, videos, a lot of content is available online. Um, there are also good books, authors available. Uh, some we've mentioned in our course overview. Uh, you could uh, get them for free. And I think some of these PDFs are, uh, we will make just, we'll put it up on the coursework section if you're interested in reading. Of course, there's a lot to read. I do not expect you to be able to read everything in the next four months, uh, but hopefully the, the PDFs we give you will you know, condense content from various sources and will be uh, useful to you as we go along. All right, so uh, before I go further, I just wanna pause for a moment and see if there are any uh, questions people have about the course, uh, things we're going to cover, uh, or things that we are not going to cover. Uh, any questions? Okay, so let's get, um, let's get started with our first uh, chapter. I'm just gonna share the PDF so that, uh, you know, we could all follow along. And uh, so uh, an introduction here to biblical apologetics. And uh, what I really want to emphasize uh, in this first chapter uh, for us is that uh, biblical apologetics is a combination of reasoning and demonstration. It's a combination of word or wisdom and power, right? So we have to blend the two. But let's take a look at uh, the Greek word apologia itself, you know, from where we get the, uh, you know, the, where we have the English word apologetics, right? So uh, if you kind of just, uh, and I've just picked out some of these scriptures, uh, and just to have a quick look at how is this word translated? How was it used uh, in um, in the New Testament? Uh, if you will go with me to the scriptures that we see, uh, we will uh, quickly uh, trace these scriptures through. Uh, Acts chapter 22, um, Paul, Acts 22 verse 1, Paul is uh, uh, standing before, you know, he's, he's just been apprehended now. Uh, this is when Paul has returned to Jerusalem 
um, after his third missionary journey. Uh, this, was, this is somewhere around 8057 or somewhere around that time. He's, you know, he's he just goes from, uh, uh, you know, he finishes his third missionary journey. He travels back to Jerusalem. As soon as he, as soon as he gets there, uh, he, you know, he actually makes a visit to the temple, but then he is apprehended there as a, somebody who is a violator of, um, you know, the of the temple. And uh, so, you know, Paul is before a very hostile crowd. And so there he stands up. And, uh, you know, uh, very interestingly, uh, although there is uh, very uh, interestingly, it is the Jewish people who at that time have come and apprehended Paul, you know, they've you know, blamed him as a as a desecrator of the temple and so on, and you know, the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. So very interestingly, at that time, now Paul is a man who can speak Greek. Uh, the Romans are the one. The Roman soldiers are the ones who are defending him. You know, they're keeping him safe. He could have spoken in Greek, but he chooses to speak in Hebrew. Uh, he really gets the attention of his audience. I mean, these are the people who are against him, and he's not speaking pure Hebrew, it shocks them, you know, hey, he's one of us, you know. Uh, and so he begins, Acts 22, verse 1, you know, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. So that's the word apologia. So try to picture the situation, right? Paul is facing a hostile crowd of Jewish people uh, who have uh, caught him. They want to get rid of him. And he is defending. He's doing an apologia before them, okay? Acts 25 and verse 16, um, Acts 25 verse 16, does somebody want to read that for us loud, please? You can unmute your mic and read it. Acts 25, 16. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. Mm. Thank you, Samuel. So here again is the word apologia and the word apologia has been translated in, in the New King James. It says to answer for himself to answer for himself. And once again, Paul is in a very tight situation. He's standing before King Agrippa uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, and he's defending you know, charges against him. Uh, so basically he went through three kings. He went through Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. Uh, he had to stand before all of them. And in fact, you know, uh, it's very interesting to see each king's response. You know, one says, Paul, you are mad. One says, Paul, uh, I will think about what you're saying. Meet me at a later time. And another one says, Paul, you always, you almost convinced me to become a Christian. You know, so it's very interesting uh, as Paul uh, presents his defense before these three leaders um, to see the leader's response. But here's one of that instance where Paul has to apologia for himself. He has to speak up and defend himself before these leaders. So uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 3 Somebody could uh, read that for us, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 3. My defense to those who examine me is this. Okay. So here's a different situation. Thank you, uh, Brother Salas. Um, the situation here is the Corinthians. I think you can mute your mic, please. Okay. Um, the situation here. <laughs> Okay, I'm looking at my PDF, so I hope uh, students will be let in. Okay, um, so the situation in 1 Corinthians 9 is a little different. Uh, Paul, uh, the, the people in Corinth have been made to question Paul's apostleship, you know, uh, uh, because of various people have come in and sown seeds of doubt and so on. Uh, Paul's apostleship is in question. By This is not uh, by people outside the church, it's people inside the church. 
the questioning is apostleship. And so Paul says in verse 3, 1 Corinthians, and my apologia to those who are questioning my apostleship. So once again, he's defending, he's giving an answer, he's explaining to those who are questioning his apostleship. Right? 2 Corinthians 7, verse 11. Can I read? Please go ahead, Charles. First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians seven eleven. For observe this very thing that you swallowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you? What clearing of yourselves? What indignation that? What fear? What vehement desire? What zeal? What vindication? In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Mm. So here, the word apologia is used in a, in a very interesting way. It is translated here as clearing of yourselves. So what is the scenario? Uh, the Corinthian church has a lot of problems happening. Uh, and uh, so Paul has written his first episode. And then he has written his second epistle. In, and, and really, his first epistle has a strong rebuke to them that they've been tolerating sin and all these things going on. You know, so it's been a while. It, um, it's been an instructive letter. It's also been a very rebuking letter. And in response to the Apostle Paul's rebuke to them, they have done apologia. That means they have tried their best to clear themselves of the wrong, of things that were not right. And so Paul is addressing that and says, hey, you know, you saw it in a godly manner. When you received my letter, you know, you responded to it well and, uh, and you cleared yourself, you know, your apology uh, of, for the wrong that was happening, right? Uh, we look at a few more uh, and uh, uh, Let's go to Philippians 1. We'll look at verse 7. Somebody could read that. Sir, may I read? Please go ahead. Just as Philippians 1 verse 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in as much as both in my chain and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are particular with me of grace. And mm. verse 17, but the later out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Okay, yeah, thank you. So here, the context is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And Paul is saying, I am called, or you know, he has, he has the sense of responsibility, this calling, that he is engaged in the defense, in the apologia of the gospel, right? And um, the context of, so of what's happening in Paul's life, um, this must be around AD, I think somewhere around AD 64 to 66, when Paul is in, is in Rome, he's under house arrest, and he's writing his, you know, his uh, prison epistles, uh, to the Philippians, the Colossians. Now he's writing from there. He's actually in prison. Uh, uh, and, and, and he's writing from Rome. And he's saying, look, I am defending the gospel. That's my call, right? I'm, I'm presenting an apologia for the gospel. Right? Um, 2 Timothy 4.16, can somebody read that for us? Take Timothy uh, four sixteen. Um, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against me. Mm, against God is faithful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dinesh. So here the context is Paul having to deal with somebody who was really against him. He's talking about Alexander the coppersmith and uh, who opposed Paul, 
this most likely have uh, this happened in Ephesus uh, when Paul had come there, you know, he, uh, on his uh, third missionary journey. Of course, uh, Paul was there uh, in the second missionary journey, and then in the third missionary journey, Paul spent three years in Ephesus. Uh, and so it's very likely somewhere around that time there was there must have this man who was really against Paul. Now, uh, if you look in the background, it's the first missionary journey uh, at Ephesus. The goddess Diana, her influence on the city was broken. And so a lot of these coppersmiths and people who made these things, uh, you know, the uh, images of goddess Diana were really against Paul. They all got angry because, uh, and this is in Acts 19, uh, the uh, the influence of this goddess over Ephesus was broken. Subsequently, uh, um, Paul comes and spends uh, uh, three years in Ephesus. He's nurturing up the next generation of uh, leaders there. And now later on, around AD 68, Paul is writing to Timothy, his final epistle, and he's remembering all those things. He says, you know, when I went through all those things, when I made my defense, when I stood up, apologia, I stood up and spoke. You know, I had to do it all alone. Uh, so this, I think, is in Acts 20, uh, early part of Acts 20. I said, I had to do it all alone. You know, I had to defend myself. And he says, uh, so the, the context is, again, defending the gospel, standing up for the, the preaching of the gospel. Last is First Peter 3.15. Somebody could uh, read that for us. This is Peter speaking. 1 Peter 3.15. Go ahead. Go ahead, Avnir. Thank you for reading. Okay. Thank you. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Amen. Thank yeah. you. So this is Peter the Apostle speaking, right? Peter is saying, uh, he's instructing the people. Now, these were uh, Peter's writing to the Jews who have been dispersed. Uh, they are spread out in various parts of Asia Minor. So he's writing to the, the dispersion, the Jews who have been spread around. And they are going through a lot of difficulty. They are facing a lot of persecution. Uh, and uh, many of them uh, are not necessarily in well-to-do positions. And they are, you know, what they are, you know, uh, what we would call maybe, I don't know, what's the right term to use, blue-collar workers or working sometimes even as slaves, um, you know, uh, in, in those kinds of situations. Peter's writing to those people. And he's saying, I want you to do something. I want you to hold, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Hold God you know, with reverence. Hold him very sacred in your heart. And be ready to make an apologia to everyone who asks you, why do you carry this hope in you? So the context is a persecuted people, a people who don't have too much in life, who, you know, we would say are in lower rungs of society in some ways, who don't have too much going for them, but yet they are holding on to Jesus in their hearts. And when people see that, they're asking, why do you have this hope? And so Paul says, give them an apology, give them an answer, give them a defense of why you do this, but do it with meekness and fear. Okay, so we've gone through several scriptures here, uh, you know, starting from Acts 22 all the way to 1 Peter 3, just to give us a little flavor of how the word apologia is used. And I want to just listen to you uh, uh, to, okay, you know, you, we've, uh, we've all looked at these verses. What can you make of uh, the, 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 the meaning of the word apologia? And you've got to put all this together, right? So we've looked at about seven, eight scriptures, uh, different places. What do you make of the word apology? What does it mean to you, having seen how it's being used in the New Testament? Um, just feel free to share your thoughts. I would see the uh, humbleness 
can. Um, Dinesh says humility. Anita says to stand up for the gospel with meekness. Okay. Someone else? What, you know, when, you, when you look at all of these scriptures and how the word apology is used, what do you see? Go ahead, Samuel. Um, but I see a lot of defense. Uh, and I think, uh, so when I look at the context around there where uh, Christianity was just coming up, uh, Jesus Christ was crucified, uh, I, 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 un like, I understand that, you know, uh, I think mainly, you know, the, the, I mean, with the Great Commission, uh, I think the apostles were going out and uh, spreading the good news, and uh, and uh, and at the same time they had to defend. Uh, mm. So I see a lot of that. I think, um, but when I when I look at our current context, the world around us, I feel uh, the word guide should be there somewhere uh, as an apology. Mm. Where, you know, right now, it's like we don't need to defend Christianity as much as probably we had to do then, the apostles had to do then. But I feel, I see, look around and I see more people being lost, even people born in Christian families being lost. Mm. Mm. And I see um, apology are being more like a guide uh, to those who are lost. So, those are God, thank you for sharing. Thank you. I'm seeing other... Uh, responses here in the chat. Kennedy says, uh, it's a defense of your faith. Rupa says, uh, being ready to answer anyone who asks a reason. Uh, Mano says, uh, giving a strong defense for what we believe. Good, good. Let me ask you, uh, what kind of an audience was being addressed? Was it, you know, a very very supportive audience? Or would you say, in all these cases, there was a hostile audience? What do you see? Yeah, so you know, that's a very, that's a common denominator in all of these cases. You know, uh, in all of these cases, uh, the the audiences were hostile. I mean, they, they're not like, hey, Paul, we are supporting you. Come and explain to us what you believe. No, 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 no. They were like, we are against you. We want you to give us, uh, you know, uh, we are against you. Uh, it, you know, you've got to defend yourself. So uh, it is, you know, in all of these cases, um, it's really uh, an audience or a people who are against who are questioning, who are very hostile in nature. So that's a common thing we're seeing in all of these scriptures. And in all of, in those environments, Paul, uh, the others, mostly Paul, and then even Peter saying, okay, hey, you need to do an apologia. So, so apologia, while you know it is useful for us as believers, so let's example is this class that we are having. Uh, I, most of I and I, I trust that all of you are very, uh, you know, supportive. Uh, none of there's nobody here who's hostile, and we're learning apologetics. We are learning, you know, how to give a defense to the faith. So this environment is very supportive, but really, apologia is done in an environment that is hostile, um, uh, 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 you know, are people who see, like Anita is saying, people who see, threat, uh, who see Christianity as a threat or, you know, uh, people who are not supportive, um, they're very opposed to what is happening. So that's uh, one, one thing to take away from all these scriptures. Secondly, we see that um, uh, uh, apologia uh, as, as, as you see in all of these contexts, is an attempt to reason with your audience. Right? The person doing the apology uh, is doing it, as we saw, with love, with meekness, and with reverence. Right? So it is not a, um, you know, it's not a debate as such. 
It's not an argument, but rather it is an explanation that's being done with love, meekness, and reverence. That's something to take away. Right. Sometimes we think, you know, apologize means let's go debate, let's argue with people. And, you know, that's not what the Bible is encouraging us to do. In fact, we will see scripture where the Bible tells us not to get into those kinds of situations. Right. Uh, what we need to understand is that even though the crowd is very hostile, Paul is not being hostile to them. In fact, in all of these sin situations, there's a crowd that's very angry, there's a crowd that's. Uh, uh, you know, very hostile, but Paul is, you know, if you look at his, his, how he presents in each of these cases, uh, you can see compassion, you can see meekness, you can see reverence coming through. His explanation of what's, what God has done in his life or his explanation of the gospel and what, what he's going through for the sake of the gospel. That's again a common thing you see in all these scriptures and Peter emphasizes that. Okay, so our takeaway is apologia is us in the midst of a hostile environment presenting uh, an explanation, not, an, not a debate or an argument, but an explanation of what we believe, why we believe it, and we do it in love, meekness, humility, and reverence. Reverence to God, reverence to the truth that we are handling. Okay. Now, I'll just go forward here, and this is not in your notes. Uh, it's just a little side journey. We'll come back to the notes. You know, we read about the ministry of Jesus, and, uh, you know, Whenever we read about the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, our focus is on the demonstrations, the healings, the miracles, the mighty things he did. But I want to ask a question. Do you think Jesus, you know what, in a, in a modern language, you would say, do you think Jesus was an apologist? That means, do you think he explained or defended what he was doing, and can you think of some examples? Anybody? Okay, I see your responses. Anita says yes. Rose says always. Shikumar says yes. Good. Rose, why don't you I share? Like Charles, go ahead. See, I recognize your voices, even though it's been three months. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, he was an apology. Uh, apo, apo, apologist. Apologist. Okay, he was an apologist. Uh, watch, uh, like he is talking to Nicodemus, and he, that night, and Nicodemus is like, "Can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again?" He's explaining, he's telling him what he knows from within. Nicodemus doesn't know. But now he is telling him how that being born again can be. But we also see even other times when he is faced with, <clears throat> especially the, the high priests, and they, they are telling him, why are you doing this? And he's like, but now check, come on. If I am doing this because of Zerubbabel, how can this send away, how can Zerubbabel send himself away? So he has a matter, he has a content that he has within himself and he's talking to the people who do not understand what he has. Therefore, he is defending, um, if I would put it in this way, that like Peter says it in First Peter, that he is defending what is in him so that those who are listening to him are able to understand it. That's what mm. I think. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Good thoughts, Charles. Good, good. Pastor, can I say? Go ahead, please. Uh, Pastor, for me, I, I'm, I'm just thinking of uh, John chapter 10, verse 38, where he's talking to them and uh, to the Pharisees, and he's just uh, uh, saying, like, you know, to them, if you're not going to believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, and the works that I'm doing is of the Father. So he's uh, he's telling them, like, that even if at least see the works that I'm doing 
and um, you believe that i am in the father and the father is in me so in in that portion of the scriptures i just see like um, uh he has been teaching and he's also been demonstrating and in that place he's just uh, i feel that uh he's uh, like you know uh, defending by saying see look at my teaching and if you're not believing in the teaching that i'm doing look at my works so mm. he's demonstrating both the teaching and the works and saying see this is who i am i am the son of god and i'm been sent from the father so i feel that portion of the scripture uh kind of speaks strongly concerning this pastor mm. so good so jesus is defending and he's defending not only by what he is saying but he's also defending by pointing to the works and so he's presenting a, a defense for who he is good good anyone else uh, i'm just looking at the chat here let's see what's happening here uh christopher says jesus defended in parables samuel says jesus spoke about the kingdom of heaven and how things are anita says when he encountered the pharisees rupa says with the samaritan woman Alice says uh, sinners like healing on the Sabbath, and he defended why he did that. Right. So yes. So the answer, uh, I think, there is a consensus here that, you know, Jesus, while he truly was the anointed Son of God and uh, worked many miracles and healings and all of that, he also defended. you know he was also an apologist like you know in in the in, in the definition we are putting together that he defended who he was what he did why he did what he did and so on you know and it's also interesting to kind of study his approach in apologia and in defense you know uh, and and you you can look at this in the in, in the gospels for instance you know when uh, this was this is in i just mentioned a few instances this is actually a side trip no charge completely free we'll come back uh it's a little excursion we are making um when you think about jesus uh in matthew 17 the pharisees come and they say you know the question jesus and peter says hey don't you pay taxes so really their intent is to find fault with jesus and his disciples you know uh and then jesus you know of course uh he 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 tells peter to go catch a coin and so on but uh, what you find jesus doing okay sorry the the pharisees come and ask jesus is it right to pay taxes okay i, I got my scenarios mixed up but uh, they ask him is it right to pay taxes and how does jesus respond it's very very you know it's just god's the wisdom of god right he says bring me a coin and he says uh, on whose whose inscription is is it uh, on the coin and this is caesar's and jesus says give to caesar what is caesar's and give to god what is god's you know um it's really amazing because they are trying to catch him they're very hostile they actually want to trap him because if he said yes you have to give money to caesar they will think he is supporting the romans if he said no then they will turn him over to the romans so either way if he said yes or no he is going to get in trouble but look at the wisdom give to caesar what is caesar's give to god what is god's they couldn't catch him you know uh, and so there's another time in the gospel of mark it says these pharisees came to him and they tried to catch him with his words you know they like to you know we like to hold him with his words and then they couldn't they went away uh, they said like there's never a man who spoke like this they couldn't find fault with him in his words right so his works were very powerful they couldn't deny it but even his words they couldn't find fault and with his words he explained with his words he defended so you see that jesus was you know according to our definition like you know he's the great apologist because he did the works and his words were full of wisdom his works were works of power his words were words of wisdom and both ways people couldn't question 
Yeah. So we can set Jesus up as our model, as the great apologist. Who's the great apologist? Jesus, because we want to be like him. His works were works of power. His words were words of wisdom to the point that they could not catch him with his words. In fact, even the Roman soldiers, this is in John 7, you know, they had been sent by, uh, of course, there was this, uh, this interaction going on between the Pharisees and the Roman soldiers. And they sent the soldiers to capture Jesus. And then they go back without apprehending Jesus and they ask, what happened? And you know, the soldiers say, never a man spoke like this man. You know, so the soldiers were sent to capture him were so amazed by what Jesus was teaching in the temple, they went back and said, we've never heard anybody speak like him. Never a man spoke like this man. And they just didn't even apprehend Jesus, you know? So, uh, you know, we can say, you know, Jesus is the great apologist, although, uh, you know, not many tend to look at him uh, that way. But if you look very closely in the gospels, you find that, wow, this is, you know, the man that we want to be like uh, in works and in words. Okay. So now let's go back to the notes, uh, the course notes. I don't know if I'm going to finish this today. Um, all right. But in the course notes, uh, I want us to think a little bit just before we go for break. Uh, I want us to think a little bit about the apostle Peter. Right, so we read uh, we read First Peter three fifteen, where Peter says, you know, he's telling the Jewish people, the believers. Uh, he says, First Peter three fifteen, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Now. Let's think through on this, because First Peter three fifteen is a key verse for apologia for the ministry of apologetics in in many Christian circles. But I want us to think about this: Would First Peter three fifteen necessarily mean intelligent, brilliant answers, or does it, from Peter's context, also include something more? Which, you know, many times people take First Peter three fifteen. Say, okay, we have to give a defense. So then, you know, a lot of emphasis is placed on either the philosophy or the scientific or the uh, you know uh, the great theological things. But who was writing First Peter three fifteen? It was Peter. Who was Peter? He was an uneducated fisherman. How likely? is Peter thinking about strong philosophical arguments? How likely is it that Peter's thinking of some great scientific evidence-based response? How likely is it that Peter's thinking about some deep theological argument? Or is Peter thinking of something else when he says, give a defense of the gospel? Because he is an uneducated fisherman. What would Peter's defense most likely be? What I wanted to want to point us to is in Acts 4. And you think about what kind of a defense Peter gave when he was questioned in Jerusalem for his faith in Christ. We go to Acts 4 and we look at verses... Um, 13 and 14. Could somebody read this and then we'll go for our break, please? Acts 4, 13 and 14. Somebody could read this for us. Shall I read, Pastor? Please go ahead. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, 
they could say nothing against it. Amen. Mm, thank you. Think about this. Peter and John and several of the other apostles were essentially uneducated, untrained men. So for them, apologia does not necessarily, or does not always mean great philosophical arguments or great scientific evidence-based responses or great theological responses. For them, the best apologia would be what happened in verse 14. A man healed. Do you want to argue about that? Do you want to question that? So what I want to impress on our hearts is that for us, uh, while you know we are people who are educated and who've had the opportunity to learn and continue to learn and so on, uh, I'm not against uh, philosophical responses. We are going to learn that. I'm not against scientific evidence-based responses. We are going to learn that. I'm not against theological responses. We are against that. But I want us to keep very importantly, there are times when philosophy, science, theology may not convince somebody, but a miracle, a work of God cannot be questioned. And sometimes that is the best defense for the gospel that we are preaching. All right, so we're gonna take a little break. I will come back after the break. And if you have any questions, we will uh, pick it up and then move forward. Uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. God bless. Thank you.